Hello everyone, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Montgomery to the OCAD Multidisciplinary Lecture Series. Um, Dr. Montgomery trained at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in pathology. She was at the former AFIP, which a lot of us radiologists uh, know about. She is currently professor of pathology at the University of Miami after having spent uh, 21 years at Johns Hopkins. She has published numerous articles and books on GI and soft tissue pathology. She's editor in chief at, of Innovative Science Press and an author of uh, two former fascicles at the AFIP on the GI system. Um, I'm very excited to hear her talk um, on the observations of a jaded old h and &E soft tissue pathologist. I think that's our most interesting um, title yet. Uh, Dr. Montgomery, I'd um, ask you to share your screen. Okay, I hope everybody can see my screen fine. And I'm sure you saw my title already. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider classification of sarcomas over time. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the wonderful advancements that have elevated the way we practice. But I also want to point out that sometimes advancements can actually make us worse because we tend to lean on them without actually thinking. And I'm sure that you've observed that occasionally uh, in radiology and oncology. Um, is everybody here pretty much a radiology colleague? Um, usually, yes. Uh, we have a few orthopedists and uh, other, but mostly radiologists. All right, well, I'm gonna, I hope you guys don't get too bored because this is gonna be very histology based, but I'll try to make some points that are sort of more than just histology based. Okay, so basically the way we started classifying sarcomas before there were ancillary techniques is we tried our best looking at li using light microscopy and we looked for lines of differentiation. In other words, the you know resemblance to tissues that we know, but the funny thing is that we began to realize that, well, golly, a lot of neoplasms don't have a normal tissue counterpart. They're their own thing. And then, of course, over time, we would correlate with morphology versus outcome and see if we could do a better job uh, using what we learned from morphology to predict the outcome. And of course, you'll all recognize some of these uh, tumors with various lineages. So I think everybody here knows that tumors can have adipocytic lineage. But then if you think about it, a myxoid liposarcoma uh, really doesn't look that fatty. And then there are fibroblastic ones and smooth muscle tumors and skeletal muscle tumors, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get to the ones uh, for which we really don't know what uh, normal counterpart they uh, resemble and we kind of make something up. So synovial sarcoma has nothing to do with synovium, but it's a, a term created by our forefathers and we all know it. And so we just keep using it because well, that's what we do. Uh, and then, of course, in the 1980s to around 2000, then some very popular uh, diagnoses began to appear. Everything was either a hemangiopericytoma or a fibrosarcoma or what we used to call a malignant fibrous histiocytoma. And then as we got a little better and uh, refined, our, refined our skill sets a bit, we began to see more refined classifications. And you can see some of those, and you can see that also the number of entities that are recognized has really mushroomed. So there we go. So the trouble is that if you use the traditional World Health Organization classifications in clinical pra um, practice, it is, of course, based on line of differentiation. But of course, differentiation is not always obvious. And then I'm sure all of you know that uh, tumors with very diverse differentiation can have strikingly overlapping histologic features. And another thing that's hard is because there are by about 300 soft tissue entities, uh, it can be very difficult for colleagues who don't see a lot of this stuff to distinguish benign and malignant. And I'm sure many of you have encountered situations in which that was an issue. So pathologists sort of naturally group soft tissue tumors based on patterns. And of course, patterns can include the cytology, the architecture, and the appearance of the stroma. We use those things to generate a rational differential diagnosis. Uh, we look at clinical and histologic features. And then often we enhance what we start out with with application of immunohistochemistry and molecular genetics. Immunohistochemistry is very, very important in soft tissue pathology. It really uh, has, a, has a, an important role in diagnosis. It's really vastly improved the quality over time. I know uh, back when there were dinosaurs on Earth and I was a pathology resident, um, we would mistake things like proliferative fasciitis and rhabdomyosarcoma. 
that doesn't happen anymore unless you have a very inexperienced pathologist because they're very good markers of skeletal muscle differentiation so we can get some hand holding. Unfortunately, there is not a consistent sarcoma panel. Needle biopsies, of course, as all of you know, because many of you probably take a lot of them, are now the standard of care. Uh, so uh, colleagues have a tendency to waste tissue on shotgun immunolabeling protocols, and you can't do that rubbish with teeny biopsies, no matter how good they are. Back in the 1980s, everybody had these giant whack biopsies before, uh, before there was any treatment. Um, obviously, for us to select the best markers depends on, well, what we see under the microscope for initially. And in fact, most soft tissue tumors are H&E diagnoses still, uh, if you're uh, comfortable with looking at slides and, uh, and know what you could get yourself in trouble with. Obviously, immunohistochemistry needs to be applied in a curated fashion. So here are some examples of uses of immunohistochemistry, and I'm sure you all have seen these in pathology reports. And I'm sure you've heard about colleagues um, using various markers of um, smooth muscle differentiation and skeletal muscle differentiation in the past, vascular markers and Schwann cell markers. And of course, the big one for that is S100 protein, which has been around since the 1980s. It's still a wonderful marker. Uh, here are some more sophisticated markers that are based on immunolabeling oh, of transcription factors. And they include myogenin and myoD1 for skeletal muscle. And you can see these lovely uh, new vascular markers. Uh, this is a wonderful marker for melanoma, notochord, and osteoblasts express SB2, uh, SATB2. Now, of course, colon cancer also expresses SATB2, but even the dumbest pathologist can usually tell osteosarcoma from colon cancer, um, although <laughs> every once in a while, weird scenarios come up. Anyway, the one thing that real soft tissue pathologists never use is, is um, this preparation. It basically just tells you you have cells. All right, so let's kind of drill down on, on the, how some of these new transcription factors can be used in diagnosis, because you'll, you'll see these in past reports. And the first is SATB2. It is absolutely wonderful to help a pathologist pull out skeletal differentiation or osteoblastic differentiation. It stands for special AP rich sequence binding protein 2. I can never remember that. And basically, it's a special nuclear matrix protein, and it has to do with osteoblast lineage commitment. And if you take mice and take away the gene, uh, they will have messed up craniofacial uh, features. And of course, it's actually part of a, part of a rare syndrome with uh, craniofacial malformations. You guys probably know how to diagnose it. I don't. Okay, so it's a sensitive and specific marker of osteoblastic differentiation in skeletal and soft tissue tumors. And it's wonderful in very, very curated situations. So in a small biopsy, when one isn't certain whether one is dealing with osteoid or hyalinized collagen, it's a winner. Um, also, if you have a biopsy that just has this undifferentiated appearance, it can really help you uh, uh, nail down a diagnosis of osteosarcoma on a teeny biopsy. So here's a beautiful classic osteoblastic osteosarcoma. This one I think you don't need a stain for, but for illustrative purposes, you can see that the nuclei express this marker. Uh, here's a metastatic osteosarcoma that's gone to the lung. You can see some lung tissue right here. But this in isolation, this old lady can't tell what the heck it is. But this guy helps us say, yes, this is the patient's osteosarcoma that decided to take a field trip to the lung. Um, here's an extraskeletal osteosarcoma. This one is having the decency to uh, give us a little matrix there, but then there's our SATB2. On the other hand, sometimes dedifferentiated liposarcomas will have osteosarcomas, osteosarcoma-like areas. And in that situation, uh, you will not see uh, SATB2 in the well-differentiated component, but because there's skeleton differentiation, you will see it in this dedifferentiated component. So it doesn't help you in this sort of situation. On the other hand, here's a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And it actually had an area of osteosarcomatous differentiation. And guess what? That has SATB2 expression. So it doesn't help you 
uh, in, in some situations for tumor types that have a tendency to, uh, to have skeletal differentiation. So this actually happens to be an H, H3K27 trimethylation stain uh, from this uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Hmm, the thing is starting to go by itself. Awesome. On the other hand, here's where it shines. This is an example of a sclerosing epithelial fibrosarcoma. It looks very similar to an osteosarc. So here the negative SAT B2 helps you. Again, a sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma. One could consider an osteosarcoma. The negative SAT B2 is a helper. So with immunohistochemistry in the, you could say, 20th century, and actually I pilfered uh, this slide from Jason Hornick at Brigham and Women's, you could say there's this 20th century immunohistochemistry that's all about lineage. Nowadays, we can actually exploit immunohistochemistry to look for molecular markers, and there are more and more examples of these. And so you could argue there's a molecular immunohistochemistry uh, in which you can do uh, immunolabeling of protein products of gene fusion or markers that are identified by gene expression profiling to up the game. So here's a nice example of that. We'll talk about a little bit about epithelial hemangioendothelioma. Uh, for those of you who do skeletal radiology surely have seen this in the bones. And the distinctive feature of it is that it's this weird sarcoma that has endothelial differentiation but doesn't uh, consist of cells that make, you know, make lumina through which blood can pass. They're just single cells. And you see epithelioid cells in nests and cords and there's this weird stroma, and I know that has a radiologic correlation, and we get to see these little vacuoles. Uh, sometimes these are easy to mistake for metastatic carcinoma because they express cytokeratin. So here's an example, and this is something pathologists love. There's this sort of chondroid background, and notice that the malignant cells have these little holes, and some of them even have erythrocytes in them. We call them blister cells. Uh, probably the erythrocytes just get shoved in there and they aren't really flowing through, but they're cute. And of course, uh, a gene fusion was detected some time ago uh, in this tumor, 2011, by a couple of groups pretty much simultaneously. And that's, of course, the WWTR1 CAMTA1, which is the fusion you see in most examples of epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. Uh, there's a subset with an alternate fusion, but that's okay. Uh, so here is a beautiful immuno stain to CAMPTA1. It's a nuclear stain, of course, uh, and it's very nice for confirming an interpretation of epithelial hemangioendothelioma on a teeny weeny biopsy. So here are, this, here are some of the things for which there are um, immuno stains for molecular markers. Very, very convenient. Uh, I'm sure all of you recognize many of these um, genes, and it's really neat that we have immuno stains to pick these up. They're not perfect, but they work well. Uh, one that I'm fond of and have known and loved for many years is beta-catenin. Of course, it's the protein product of the CTNNV1 gene, and that's a big component of the Wnt signaling pathway. Of course, the APC gene, the adenomatous polyposis coli gene, is the biggie and, uh, in that pathway. And of course, sporadic desmoid tumors have mutations in this gene in about 85%. Uh, and then, of course, some patients who have FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis, instead have an alteration of the APC gene. Uh, but the nice thing is, regardless of which alteration, you see messed up beta-catenin. And we can exploit that on immunohistochemistry. It can be very helpful in a couple of situations, teeny-weeny biopsy of a mass, or the situation of a recurrence of tumor versus a scar. Ah, that drives us crazy. So here's a beautiful mesenteric fibromatosis. Uh, let me get you oriented. This is small bowel mucosa. Whoops, decided to back off, back, back up. I'm obviously clicking something. So we have eh, lumen here. This is a, the small bowel with the little villi, submucosa. And then there's this tumor invading into the muscularis propria. And this is how it looks at higher magnification. To me, this is an H&E diagnosis. I don't actually very often use the beta-catenin stain. But in meta meta uh, mesenteric fibromatoses, you get this really cool thing in which the proliferating cells kind of pull open the vessels. And it's, I think it's just really cute. And this is very high magnification of a mesenteric fibromatosis. 
And if you look, let me, I'll bore you with some cells. These are endothelial cells. And you can see that the lesional cells actually have paler cytoplasm. So you, you can really uh, see them uh, very well. And if you're struggling, you can do a beta-catenin stain. So I always tell pathologists, you need to find yourself a vessel and make sure the nuclei of the endothelial cells are, are not staining. So if you're looking, let's see, I've done something. Ah, so sorry, I, it keeps moving something when I use my pointer. But you can see there's a little bit of cytoplasmic staining in the endothelial cells there, whereas the tumor cells have this nice nuclear staining. And you'll notice that not all of the nuclei stain, and that's pretty typical. Uh, here's an example in which a very overstained beta catenin preparation was made. But luckily, I've taken a picture with the vessel in the middle, and there's one on the side, and you can see that those nuclei are negative. So you have even an internal control there, so you can still interpret the stain. So sarcomas can be viewed in a very, very simple way because I'm a simpleton, and that really can help with H&E classification. Uh, there are translocation slash gene fusion associated sarcomas with simple karyotypes, and then there are ugly pleomorphic sarcomas with complex inconsistent karyotypes. Uh, and once a pathologist knows that, actually you can do a much better job classifying them on hematoxyl and eosin. So this is an example of two things that pathologists love to mix up. So on the left is a mix, ugh, silly thing. On the left, it's not letting me use the pointer very well. Here's a mixofiber sarcoma. These are taken at the same magnification. The nuclei of the malignant cells are way bigger than the nuclei of the malignant cells in the mixoid liposarcoma. This is a translocation sarcoma. So the cells are very, very uniform and actually pretty small. These are vessels, so the endothelial cells are actually bigger, or the nuclei are bigger than the malignant nuclei. Whereas here, I think this, this is part of an endothelial cell here, so it's a little bit misleading, but this is very different. This is, of course, an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, and you can see pleomorphic means many shapes, and you can see that the nuclei indeed have many sizes and shapes. Uh, this is a beautiful example of a lyomyosarcoma. Uh, I told you there would be a lot of histology, but I love it. Um, and you, there's an anaphase bridge. So that tells you it's not a translocation sarcoma. It has uh, chromosome instability. On the other hand, this is a desmoplastic small round cell tumor. And to me, this is super cool. This is a super high magnification picture. The cells look malignant as hell to me, but notice that their nuclei are smaller than the nuclei in the myofibroblasts in this uh, desmoplastic stroma. So super cool. This is a normal mitosis, not an abnormal mitosis. So really, really neat. And these, of course, have a characteristic translocation and fusion. This is another beautiful desmoplastic small round cell tumor. You can see, if you're used to histology, that it's extending into this small bowel. And some poor colleague um, mistook this for a carcinoma. Oops, even though it was a young kid. Here it is at higher mag. But what I wanted you to see at higher mag is that the, the, cell, the nuclei are quite uniform. And of course, the keratin fooled a colleague, and the colleague diagnosed a carcinoma. Uh, this is the Desmond, of course. And those of you who are used to these things know that they have all this uh, aberrant expression of various, uh, various lines of differentiation. Uh, this is a beautiful example of an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, of course, a translocation tumor. And these were uh, originally are believed to have fusions of the of the Pax forkhead gene, either Pax three or um, a Pax seven, and then you'll notice the word forkhead. So the initials for it um, had to be changed because it's not polite to pronounce it in public situations. So it was changed to Fox01. So you obviously can't go around pronouncing F K H R. But what you will notice is that. Uh, there are nuclei in this cancer. So here's the internal control, and here's the nasty, nasty alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. And of course, in pathology, we look for rhabdomyoblasts. I will confess that I did zero immunostains, and then of course, this was sent for fusions because it was a child uh, and proved to have the um, 
PAX, uh, PAX3 uh, fusion, unfortunately, for the patient. And here's just another rhabdomyoblast, but I want you to mostly see that the nuclei are very, very uniform. All right, here's a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma described initially by Harry Evans at MD Anderson. It looks very similar to a fibromatosis. Uh, it just has different architectural features. Here it is at higher magnification, and all I want to point out is that it has very uniform but hyperchromatic nuclei. And I know that this is kind of boring path, uh, but I'm just making a point. So on the left, we have the fibromatosis, and on the right, the low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. Same lab, same stain, same magnification. And you can see there's quite a lot of difference uh, in the nuclear features. And nowadays, of course, uh, you can get a beautiful quick confirmation of this interpretation just by uh, using MUC4 staining. MUC4 stands for more mucin core protein number four. So it should be a carcinoma thing. But when Jason Hornick did uh, uh, gene profiling, he found that this a molecule, for whatever reason, was upregulated in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, and damned if it isn't a great confirmatory immunostain. Uh, let's just speak briefly about tumors with EWSR1 fusions, and I'm sure everybody in the group knows that the prototype for this was Ewing sarcoma, uh, and of course the official name of that gene is uh, Ewing sarcoma RNA binding protein number one. And this is a very, very special gene because for whatever reason, uh, when there's a translocation between this gene and a whole lot of genes that encode transcription factors, the, the system works and weird uh, chimeric proteins are produced that are involved with tumor genesis. So it's really this ubiquitous tumor maker gene. Uh, people used to say it was promiscuous. I'm sure you've all heard that. And look at the list of tumors that are at play. And what started to blow my mind is when colleagues realized that there were these carcinomas that in fact had EWSR1 fusions, and two of them are at the bottom. Both of them are characterized by very monotonous nuclei. Uh, and all of the tumors that are in this list in the soft tissue category generally have very monotonous nuclei. So really, really cool. Uh, just to give an example of another tumor besides Ewing's that has um, an EWSR1 fusion, uh, it, it, uh, we talk about the clear cell sarcoma of soft tissue. Of course, this was originally uh, described by Franz Enzinger, who passed away some time ago, uh, and, uh, and on H&E in 1965, and Franz found that these were tumors of young adults. They had a very characteristic morphology, and in fact, they expressed the same proteins that you see in melanoma. So for a while, it was very fashionable to call this melanoma of soft parts. That's a dumb idea. Uh, in the pre-immunotherapy era, if you had a two centimeter melanoma, you were gonna die. If you had a two centimeter clear cell sarcoma, you had a chance. So they behaved like sarcomas, not melanomas. So that's kind of gone out of fashion. And here's how they look. And I just want you to see the monotonous nuclei, even though I know histology is my thing and not yours. And here they are at higher magnification. I think they're just beautiful. Notice the macronucleoli in these cells. And in fact, I learned from the late Franz Enzinger that when he first started collecting these tumors as they would come in, he kind of noticed they were in people's hands and feet. And then he noticed that they had these macronuclei, and he told me he had a little drawer where he was setting them aside until he had enough to really uh, see if he had an entity. He called them bird's eye tumors. And you can see why uh, Dr. Enzinger did this, because, well, they look like bird's eyes in the nuclei. The other problem with clear cell sarcomas is they love to make these giant cell tumors. And remember, they grow in the hands and feet. So sometimes knuckleheaded pathologists diagnosed them as tenosynovial giant cell tumors. Big problem in the past, not such a big problem nowadays with modern immunohistochemistry. So on the left, we have a clear cell sarcoma, and on the right, we have a tenosynovial giant cell tumor, and you can see how a colleague might go down the garden path on these. Luckily, nowadays, um, uh, folks can uh, add immunolabeling and not go down that particular garden path. 
can uh, clear cell sarcomas of Ken and she's uh, express S100 protein as well as the old uh, antibody HMB45, which is usually for melanoma. Clear cell sarcoma has a relentless survival curve on vintage data. In fact, these are data from, actually, I think they're data that I published years ago with Jean Mace, who's now at MD Anderson. Uh, as you can see in the old days, they tended to have lymph node metastases, and unfortunately, they can bust out after 10 years after the original surgery. But tumors with, um, that are itty bitty when they present are often associated with a good prognosis. And as we mentioned, these behave like a sarcoma. Extraskeletal Ewings. Okay, so you guys are radiologists. You know way more about the distribution of Ewings than I do. Uh, most of the time it pops up in the long bones. Uh, but then um, um, about 20, 10 to 20, probably 15% are extraskeletal. Uh, as you know, that most folks with Ewings are young. And of course, back when there were dinosaurs on Earth, the chest wall ones got called Askin tumors uh, because Fred Askin, my former colleague at Hopkins, who'd been at UNC, uh, first wrote about them. And here's what they look like, absolutely monotonous. I always try to take pictures with internal endothelial cells. So here's one, and you can see the tumor cells are really not much bigger. And here it is at HIMAG. And back in the day before we had immunolabeling, I used to confirm Ewing's just, you know, for a little hand holding by getting a periodic acid shift stain and looking for glycogen. That's how bad it was. But, you know, you do what you can with what you got. So this was my special stain back in the day uh, to confirm Ewing's sarcoma, looking for glycogen. And there it is after diastase. So remember, you digest the PAS with diastase, which is basically amylase. So back in the day, the histotech would spit on the slide, uh, and that would uh, digest the, uh, the glycogen, and then you'd, you'd see what happened. So pretty cool. Nowadays, of course, we start with CD99, and Ewing sarcoma should have strong, diffuse staining. Now, of course, I'm sure all of you in radiology have seen enough path reports that you know that CD99 stains a lot of stuff. And here's that one at HIMAG. Uh, this is the famous primitive neuroectodermal tumor of the past. We now know that that's just a subset of the morphology of Ewing sarcoma, uh, but I just put one in because it's pretty to see with that lovely pseudovascular or vascular pseudo rosette in the middle. Or actually, there are three of them in the field. And here's one of them at very high magnification. And here's a beautiful CD99. Okay, so of course we have nice immuno labeling for Ewing sarcoma, and of course nowadays if we're really suffering, we can look for EWS R1 rearrangements. Uh, unfortunately, there are lots of different things that EWS R1 fuses with, but the typical one is uh, FLY1 or ERG. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sure all of you have learned that there are all these things that we used to call Ewing's-like things, and now they turn out to be something else. Of course, nowadays with modern work, many, many patients with Ewing sarcoma can be cured, but of course those, those poor kids who walk in the door with uh, metastases have a horrible outcome. There is some prognostic impact of uh, percent tumor necrosis in resection, so that's kind of nice. Nowadays, of course, we have to worry about the CI or sick, I like to call them sick ducks because the poor patients are sick ducks, and these have been described in the last 10 years. Uh, they're nasty, nasty, aggressive sarcomas. Uh, these are, again, round cell sarcomas. When you're the pathology guy, you first start out with your little CD99, and eh, it sort of stains, but not very well. Uh, so there, you realize that you have to um, send it for molecular, and unfortunately, if you pull out tumors with this fusion, the, the sick dux 4 uh, they are dead within a couple of years. And so far, there may be something new, but the last time I checked, nothing touches these things. Here's an example of one. This is uh, just right up under the skin, just very, very monotonous. Brown cells, to me, it looks very, very similar to Ewing, and you really do have to work them up. There's another subset that's new on the scene, and those are the B-core rearranged sarcomas. These are a little better than the than the um, the sick ducks, as I like to call them. Uh, much 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 less aggressive. Uh, they're still very respectable sarcomas, 
They do have nuclear expression of B core, but sadly that's very nonspecific. So actually you sort of can get a side door help for these also by doing SAT B2. And of course these will look very different from an osteosarcoma, so you can't screw that up because osteosarcomas typically have pleomorphic cells. Here's one, and as you can see, it looks very similar to these other EWSR1 rearranged uh, lesions that I've shown you. It tends to have a myxoid backdrop that you can kind of see uh, down here. And here it is, but higher mag with that myxoid backdrop, and it's still higher mag. So I'm sure you're all saying, wow, this looks just like the other ones. They do look very similar, and you do have to do your homework on these. What I have found really interesting as the molecular era has busted out, because I'm, you know, an old lady who's been doing this for a jillion years, is that there are all these things that are completely different that share fusions. So the top one I've listed, uh, the malat one GLE-1 fusion, is shared by this malignant rare tumor called gastroblastoma and a perfectly benign tumor called plexiform fibromyxoma. And you can see the same thing for all of these other things with shared rearrangements for very, very different types of lesions. So just to kind of illustrate the first one, I'm going to show you a plexiform fibromyxoma. They've been reported in the stomach and small bowel and they're usually antral. And I'll show you what it looks like under the microscope. Uh, this is what you might see. So it looks a little bit like a succinate dehydrogenase gastrointestinal stromal tumor in that it's plexiform, but uh, it can be very myxoid. This is a different case. And of course, by plexiform, what we mean are these little nodules of tumor, and this is all muscular propria, so nodule, muscle, nodule, muscle, and it basically means the tumor is kind of growing every which way. And of course, as you know, the classic plexiform thing is a neurofibroma in patients with NF1, but other tumors can have that plexiform thing. And remember, we make our slides in two dimensions. And this is just high magnification of one of those and very bland looking. This, on the other hand, is the gastroblastoma, same place, muscularis propria stomach, and these are malignant with the same fusion. So here's one of these, this gastroblastoma. So it's in the muscularis propria of the stomach. It has these epithelioid areas and spindled areas. And when we do immunostains, um, it has expression of epithelial markers in the areas that look epithelioid and no expression in the spindled areas. And again, this is malignant. So gastroblastoma and plexiform fibromyxoma, same fusion clear cell sarcoma and angiomatoid FH, fibrous histiocytoma, very different outcomes. Uh, luckily, the h &E findings were described first. So we already knew the outcome based on the boring old fashioned stuff. And then we can enjoy uh, enhancing our skills with the, with the uh, ancillary techniques. Um, but on the other hand, this is a paper that was published recently. And I'm certainly not trying to insult the authors. I, I know several of them and they're lovely people. Uh, but these colleagues wrote a paper about glee run rearranged neoplasms. And this is a picture from their paper. Well, there's obviously more than one type of neoplasm in this series. And so guess what? In the series, some were malignant, some were benign. Well, duh, because there's probably different entities in there. And I, I, I assure you, I'm not trying to insult the colleagues. I'm just trying to make a point. So for me, as an old lady, it's bad enough with these rare sarcoma fusions and you know, how helpful are they really? Uh, can you imagine if KRAS mutation was discovered before the common sense classifications? Because you can find KRAS mutations in benign tissue. So, ah! okay, so this is something I say to pathologists. So I know you're not pathologists, but I'm gonna guess you can have the same principles in radiology. Um, if you go right away to fancy techniques when you don't quite know where the lesion is or that, that sort of thing. So I like to tell um, sort of how to, examples of doing it right. And I wish I did it right every time. I don't, but I will tell you what would be good. So I'm gonna show you a quick four cases. They're pathology cases. And um, we're gonna combine morphology and curated testing. 
So I, I'm going to show you needle biopsies were done of an axillary mass from a woman in her 60s. There was no other information provided, and here we go. So here are these biopsies, and as you can see, uh, the radiologist did a nice job and took some nice cores uh, and had some bad luck because most of the cores had a bunch of rubbish, and two of the cores have lesional tissue. But you can see that's a pretty tiny fleck of tissue. So each of the ones with the arrows on them are probably less than a millimeter, way less than a millimeter. And here's one of them at high magnification. So I think you can see there's some kind of tumor, even if you don't do this for a living. And here it is at higher magnification. So remember, I'm in the axilla of a woman. And so for me, with the H&E appearance and the demographics, the top two choices are metastatic breast lobular carcinoma and a weird looking melanoma. So I organized for two stains and then I left a few unstains depending on where the first two pointed me. So this is, these are the two. On the left is CAM 5.2. That was for me to catch breast cancer, negative. On the right was SOX 10. That was for me to catch melanoma. But the morphology was weird for melanoma. So I thought, okay, we need to do a little more homework. So I did an HMB 45, which is negative, And I did an INI1 or SMARC B1 that shows loss of nuclear staining. And so that was an epithelioid malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. So we were able to make a very sophisticated diagnosis with a teeny, teeny, tiny piece of tissue and four immunostains. And that allowed tissue for molecular profiling uh, should the oncologist feel it's needed. So basically, we had a curated approach with a plan. So then you might wonder, why don't we just grind the silly tumors up as they come in and not waste efforts on silly methods that were developed literally centuries ago? This is why. Because they might be completely benign and not need any intervention. So for example, on in this image is a so-called epithelioid cell histiocytoma. They're 100% benign, but they have ALK overexpression and ALK fusions. You don't need to target this. You're done. It's out. On the other hand, if it were a big mesenteric lesion and were obviously morphologically an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, we would want to be targeting. Okay, number two, leg mass, young adult, three centimeters, excised and sent to pathology. So here is the box of slides. Um, I hope the numbers don't show well enough to read. I don't think they do. Those green stickers are from my days at Johns Hopkins, but this was this giant box of slides. And there was an iron stain and a vimentin. And here's the tissue. And it's just a benign fibrous histocytoma. I've been diagnosing these on H&E since the 1980s. And it still works. And it has all the features. I won't bore you with them. And here it is at higher magnification. Those of you who've done any path will remember the collagen trapping of dermatofibroma forward slash benign fibrous histocytoma. And this is that. There's some nice hemosiderin. Yes, these can have some funny cells, but the overall context is what matters. And the colleagues had done this silly vimentin stain. And they had done more of it. And then the trouble is that there's a stain called CD34, and it stains any uh, sort of fixed tissue uh, dendritic cells, we call them, uh, but not fibrous histiocytomas, but it stains DFSP, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberan. Also, the colleagues thought that this response to the tumor was, in fact, uh, the tumor. No, no, no. And so it, that should have had no stain, not cost a fortune, okay? Case number three, a needle core biopsy was performed of a retroperitoneal mass from an adult. This was a consult case, and it had been diagnosed as malignant fibrous histocytoma of the retroperitoneum, and a giant uh, operation had been performed, which probably wasn't so terrible. Um, I'm sure the colleagues in this group know that uh, nowadays we realize that pretty much almost every, with a few exceptions, big retroperitoneal sarcoma is actually uh, de-differentiated liposarcoma, no matter what it looks like. Uh, so a little bit naive, but that's okay. And here it is. And obviously, uh, this, this is a nerdy past slide, but it's not quite right for ple pleomorphic sarcoma. You would think about uh, a de-differentiated liposarcoma here. And this one had had 
27 immunostains, but not a single one that might have helped using the morphology. And I'm showing you a classic field here. And you can see there are some histiocytic nuclei indicated by the arrows, and they've engulfed other cells without destroying them. And that phenomenon is called empiripolysis. Here's more of it with histiocytic cells that have engulfed lymphoid cells without destroying them. So there are halos around the lymphoid cells. And of course, this is S100 protein, and this is Rosai-Dorfman disease uh, that happened to involve the retroperitoneum. The S100 protein stain is beautiful here. Uh, what you'll notice is that S100 stains the nuclei and cytoplasm of the abnormal histiocytes in Rosai-Dorfman disease, and it doesn't stain, of course, the lymphocytes that those funny cells have ingested. So beautiful field here. Last case, needle biopsy of a retroperitoneal mass from a 60-year-old woman. No other information available. Here it is. And here it is at higher magnification. And here's the box of slides. And you can see that a whole lot of expensive tests have been done. But a smear had been done right up front, and it was actually diagnostic of the entity. And here's the smear. This is a Romanowski stain, like the kind that's done for a peripheral blood smear. And what you can see is a lot of histiocytic cells. And then these funny little lines. And that's mycobacterium avium complex. Uh, here's a beautiful, better picture of it that my former colleague Amy Duffield took. She's a hematopathologist now at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, and she took this picture from the same case. Uh, and you can see the waxy mycobacterial forms. And then, of course, for fun, we did add an acid fast bacillus stain. And everything red is a, is a bug. And there's a, another similar preparation from another case. So what I've kind of tried to in, reinforce, and I'm mostly doing tips for pathologists, but I'm guessing that for radiologists, it translates the same way. Remember the basics. Go to your basics and press out. And uh, for pathology, it's be the best morphologist that you can be, and then use modern tools to elevate you. Use the tools in a curated fashion and have a plan as you go through. Uh, of course, for us in pathology, needle biopsies are the thing. For those of you taking needle biopsies, the the ones who really think about it and plan carefully choose the best areas to poke uh, to get the most information. And I know the really wonderful radiologists with whom I work are really clever about saying, okay, let's think about this tumor. What's the best, what are the best places to choose to get ourselves the best diagnosis? Uh, so I'd like to close by saying, uh, don't waste, uh, don't waste stuff on poorly planned testing. Don't take your biopsies uh, in a way that's not going to be informative. And uh, the last thing for pathologists is don't order a Vimentin. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Montgomery. Very uh, informative and also entertaining talk, which is something I never thought I'd say about a pathology talk. I know, right? So boring, <laughs> slides, ugh. That's um, probably how you guys feel about radiology talks. Um, Actually, I always enjoy them, but I have no idea what I'm looking at. <laughs> well, <laughs> I felt that bit on this one. Uh, well, thank you again. Uh, any questions from the group? Are there, uh, you know, soft tissue sarcomas and soft tissue masses a lot of times are very um, nonspecific for radiologists. Um, uh, are there any pairs of diagnostic or uh, pairs of entities that are diagnostic dilemmas or things that maybe um, naive or early stage pathologists commonly have trouble with that maybe radiologists can help with? Gosh. You know, know what, I'm so numbers. dumb, I don't know. Can you think of an example like of that? No. I mean, obviously, if you have a tiny needle biopsy, I know I frequently am on the horn, you know, with radiologists saying, well, they have a fatty component. You yeah. know? So that's super helpful. Okay. Yeah, I know for bone, bone tumors, there's a lot of times. Oh, can, yeah, no. Bone tumors, it's something. all radiology. Like, you guys make the diagnoses on bone tumors. You know, we're just the knuckleheads who confirm. But anyway. I'm sure you've seen the new WHO uh, Bible that came out in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. were, were there any changes that were um, very long um, in coming that you know everyone was like, oh, finally? And conversely, are there any changes that um, you think are controversial or maybe should not have been made? Um, yeah, but most of it's tempest in a teapot. So, oh. <laughs> um, for example, 
I think it's probably good that the entity that uh, spindle cell and pleomorph or atypical spindle cell and pleomorphic lipomatous tumor uh, was now sort of clarified. There'd been a sort of BS entity uh, called spindle cell liposarcoma that probably really wasn't a sarcoma. So it was okay. nice that that got, got now thrown in the benign category. So that was really good. Uh, there is a lot of argument that's very tempest in a teapot about myxo-inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma, but it's tempest in a teapot. So I can't really, in fact, there, I'm one of the people in the tempest. So they put all of us who were the tempest in the teapot and had made us write it. <laughs> so nobody was happy. <laughs> Excellent. And then I know like, for example, there's an unusual um, vascular lesion of the liver that I have strong opinions about and other colleagues had different ones, but again, tempest in a teapot. Okay, good. Um, and then, yeah, we have uh, one from uh, Dr. Mark Murphy, who's, uh, I don't know if you guys overlap. The oh, we know, of course. Okay. I, Dr. Murphy and I have, have spent some time together. Excellent. He's thanking you for the um, emphasis on the importance of getting representative tissue. Particularly. Yeah, well, the good radiologists are really good. Like if the issue is D-diff liposarc, y'all will nail some fatty stuff and nail some solid stuff and then we're done. Yeah, I'm in a dark room, so. <laughs> oh, you must be a radiologist. Yeah, or a pathologist, one of those two. Um, how, how often do you find it helpful if we give you a differential to limit or to direct which immunos you do first um, or what side of genetic aberrations you look for first? Do you find that useful or not? I mean, not, as you know, for soft tissue tumors, it's not that helpful, but obviously for bone tissues, our bone, bone biopsies, y'all are way ahead of us from the get-go. And then, but I don't really find it particularly helpful when colleagues suggest a workup because it's often not the right one. <laughs> but I guess okay. it depends on the colleague. Thank you. Dr. Montgomery, thank you again for the uh, wonderful talk. All right, well, thanks for having me. What a nice group this is. Thank you very much. All right, bye everyone.